So, you should watch how I made the spontaneous decision to make a full outfit with two pieces and a hat of historical clothing in the four weeks before Christmas. And I'll share how much I spent because this ain't cheap and maybe it's fun. It was a month till Christmas and I am planning on going to my first Regency Ball this summer and I had no other plans to deviate from that. I ran into the store and I found this gorgeous red fabric. I think this is a sign. I realized I really needed to make this very tight fitting 1813 fashion plate outfit. Usually I, I average like one garment every two months. I really want to make a cute little outfit. So it was basically an impulse purchase when I saw this fabric. Cause I didn't want to wait one year to make another festive outfit. And then I realized I had to be all in ASAP because I wanted a deadline of like December 20th so I could post about it and wear this very festive look out. And then cue the downward spiral of me having to spend money on the wool pants and the trim. But okay, here we go. This is like the shortest deadline I've ever set for myself. Doing a coat, pantaloons, and the hat in four weeks. Did I do it or did I just finish it just now? Hi, I am Phil and I have been sewing since 2020 and have since taken a sharp, deep dive into the world of making garments for myself, particularly leading into historical and general cosplay. These videos I think will be a place for me to just get all of the thoughts that I have out in my head. Because I have a lot of thoughts that I, no one necessarily wants to hear, but maybe someone who's into any of this wants to hear all these detailed thoughts. I skated as a kid, and between, I still love skating, and, and considering my growing love for 19th, early 19th century fashion, I've been preparing for this Regency Ball, my first historical ball of any sort, because I have been getting this since 2020, but that's for another video. I've been slowly preparing over about eight months for this Regency Ball, set 1818, 18, 18. And so that's my main focus. I've been fitting a jacket for me. I thought, well, I'm, this is a Spencer jacket, a short jacket. All I have to do is make the same jacket that I've been making a mock-up of, and I don't even have to make a fancy collar for it, and um, I just cut off the tail, so it's like halfway done already, or it's basically done. I just gotta figure out how to add the clasps and or the, the buttons. So this look, when I've been wearing it out, I've been getting comments that it looks like Santa or the Nutcracker. Well, some news, the red wool and like white-ish fur trim is actually predates Santa. This is before Santa wore it. This is the short answer. Going with reference number one, Tchaikovsky's Nutcracker Ballet premiered in 1892. Based off of Prussian author E.T.A. Hoffman's story, The Nutcracker and the Mouse King, which was written in 1816. So close to... 1813. And yes, though, like the Nutcrackers are just soldiers or general military and clothing of the Regency period takes a lot of influence from military. Actually, every piece of this outfit has some sort of military influence. References to military wear was ubiquitous between both men and women throughout this period. While the concept of Santa in a general sense predates uh, 1813, I think the Santa that we know him today and like his, his look his current look kind of started in about 1862 officially when American cartoonist Thomas Nast drew some illustrations in Harper's Weekly magazine. When it comes to the general look of red with white trim on Santa, further cemented into general pop culture when in 1930 Coca-Cola had released ads of a Santa that looked just like we know him today. These ads were inspired by Clark Clement Moore's 1923 poem, A Visit from St. Nicholas, or as we know it, The Night Before Christmas. To me, I just consider the wool and fur look, it's just a functional, fashionable winter look. So this look is like a very specific look. It's not your typical Regency tail coat. This was actually, I sort, I suppose, a sort of uniform for this group called Les Gilets Rouges, or the or the red vests, or red waistcoats, and this is what the group wore in a book, or they consider France's first ice skating manual, Le Vrai Patineur, or The True Skater, pardon my French, written by Jean Garcin. There are eight engraved plates that look similar to the original fashion plate. The fashion plate was from another periodical, but we can see other versions of this. Anyway, they're a skating group, and this book teaches the artistry of being an ice skater, we'll say. 
Okay, so from the reference to the actual fashion plate, this red jacket is it's called a Spencer coat. So if you look at the subtitle of this fashion plate, it essentially, I'm not going to say this French. It basically, it's a Spencer jacket garnished with astrakhan fur. And if you recognize the Spencer name, yes, it is referring to a far back relationship of the late Diana Spencer, rest in peace. So while I didn't have an exact pattern for this per se, I took a pattern that I was refining for my main Regency dress coat and just, you know, made some edits from there. I cut the front off. I didn't even have to worry about adding any sort of collar because I just tr added the trim to the collar. And after, you know, a few things, I just had to make some edits and find the button placement. Disclaimer, I do not claim any sort of historically accurate uh, sewing methods. I try to, you know, do what kind of respects the silhouette at least and hopefully it does that. So basically when it comes to this pattern, I first removed the whole skirted section, just had this short, short thing, and I could just later on hem it as I'd like when I had it on. I added a little, just for like the sake of improv, I added a little more at the neckline as you see in one of these pictures, just so I could kind of cut it back at my own leisure because I didn't have a pattern, so I was gonna freehand it. I took off a few inches from, you know, the closure, the front closure, because I really wanted a really fluffy fur to just fill in those gaps as pulled together by the cords, as you can see. I pondered about making a small collar to add some height to the fur trim, but after checking out the trim, I realized it just weren't. There was enough height with the fur trim that I had. I decided not to do a center back seam because I was feeling very sassy, and I didn't think it really needed it. So I didn't put one and, but you can notice I had a little mishap in the back and ended up having to add a little like square of fabric because it's cute and, and cause piecing is period. So next I definitely had to make a little mock-up to figure out where my buttons were and I kind of really hated dealing with these buttons <laughs> because obviously I knew that like going straight down would not fit my curvy body because essentially the further down you go it kind of like cones into my waist, <laughs> if that makes any sense. Basically, if I put a straight line down my center, for some reason it just doesn't work if I put a put everything perpendicular to my center front, front because the bottom is coming in a little bit faster than the tops because of my chest and because I'm trying to keep the waist snatched. Anyway, once I had drawn up a mock-up, just kind of arbitrarily drew, drew lines on where I thought, and I didn't even have buttons at the time, I just, okay, I think I'll find something for like, an, you know, an inch and a half, two inches, and I'll just go from there. Because I didn't have enough time, so I was kind of trying to push through this. So I put down my revised coat front and sleeve patterns, which I already had made the custom fit for, to my future Regency tail coat down on the wool on the floor and thread marked the whole pattern marking my seam lines and vague button placement and this took a long time. Then I cut the pieces out and just hand sewed everything together and then press your seams open. I pressed my seams open. Uh, be careful because well wool's easy. Wool's nice. Wool's, wool's, wool's your good duty when it comes to pressing. Oh and if you found this interesting if you wouldn't mind hitting the subscribe button and liking my video and are interested in following my nerdy thoughts and all the things that go into construction and and about menswear of different times. So call me crazy but I kind of like hand sewing myself and I like the charm of the threads that do inevitably poke through because it's just so tight. And honestly it doesn't even take that much longer in my opinion because all the setting down of the fabric and lining up everything on the machine, but particularly on the curved seams in the back. Uh, I like just having that control and the unevenness. You get used to the unevenness of, of hand stitching. But when you look at like a sewing machine stitches, they almost look too perfect once you get used to hand stitching after a while. Ideally, I would have liked to use a nicer and thicker wool, but this was purdy and it was cheap and I needed to make it work so I started ended up uh, interfacing with just a random like felt to make it kind of cushier and softer and of course I added some I don't even know what I have do I have linen canvas or do I have horse hair I got it at a thrift store and it basically like one of those <laughs> I don't know where I learned this from I guess I literally have seen people on Instagram do it but essentially what I'll do is I'll baste in the interfacing in the shape of the pattern without the seam allowance place it in and kind of use it as like a template and then I'll like hem over or like or f I'll fold the seam allowances over it 
and then just like kind of sew them closed so it sticks in and they just kind of hang in there sewed in with in with the seam allowances I, I like it because it just kind of like, I don't know, it makes everything kind of clean. Once the main bodice was done, I had to move on to the buttons. And the buttons were, I found, I live in New York City, so I was able to just go downtown and search the three button stores until I found the perfect buttons. And they weren't the right color, so I was considering paints, acrylic paints. And then I was realizing, or so I read that I could just use nail polish. And I tried to find the right red, and it wasn't quite, but it looked nice. It, it's not a perfectly perfect match, but I think it looks it looks cute. I also read just took some pins to cardboard, stuck them down, put the pins on, painted them quite a few times, and added a top coat. It really helps to put down those pins. One pin, actually two pins for specifically this button, because then they'll just go like oh all over the place when you're just trying to like paint them like this, and it's kind of annoying. But two pins is great because they don't move. And then I use a thick uh, double F thread. I use that for making oa reeds. A thick red thread that I had laying around to tie in these buttons. And then I backed them with just two smaller cheap buttons that I had just as a sort of support because otherwise it's just like heavy button against cloth. But then I added the level of a hard button to just kind of fight back with it. Thank you to the Facebook group Regency Costuming for that advice. Very helpful. So I knew the initial marks that I had made to my jacket were kind of rough and I knew they weren't going to be perfect. So I kind of painstakingly sewed them in where I thought they would and then I rearranged the ones I thought were asymmetrical, didn't look good. I hated tying in those buttons because I, and that thread was thick and everything was just thick and just a lot of laborious sewing. And then I was just like, I'm done obsessing over with the, the symmetry and the perfection of these buttons because I'm still in time crunch. So I moved on until I was happy enough with them. And I also thought like the pic, the main picture is, has your arms crossed so most of those buttons are going to be kind of zhuzhed around anyway. But then there's some pictures ugh, that I took that I really hate how asymmetrical and how floppy some of those buttons are, but... As for the sleeves, I also made my own kind of general pattern of like a relatively puffy sleeve. And then I just kind of take it in as needed. I'd rather have more than, than not enough. So I have like a lot of ease and then just kind of like ease it in or like cut it and just move it in just so to make the the puff more or less uh, but I realized um, if I did it everything too flush that particularly like reaching forward I couldn't I couldn't get enough movement so I needed to add a little puff just kind of in the back or more puff than on the top of the shoulder essentially the puff is there to kind of relieve some tension in the in the sleeve when being pulled forward you can see in some other fashion plates that there's some a little extra puff in the back where the back arm meets the, the shoulder seam so there's extra movement so next i have to work on the cording of this jacket now that i have the beads painted the buttons i guess they feel like beads though that stuff's sewed down now i can start with the cording and honestly obviously it would have been nice to have silk or cotton cording but honestly i'm really glad that these were polyester because it made cutting them and kind of reattaching them so much easier because I basically like melted them. I took the cut ends that I kind of just estimated by tying them around the buttons and then cut them to length, put them in into a flaming stove <laughs> and then just kind of like mush them together until they kind of re-solidified after they had melted together. A lighter probably would have been less dramatic but how boring would that be? I would love to know how any other cord of any other fiber would be cut and reconnect to form just a loop. Comment below if you have any advice. Honestly, I was living for this coat before all the trim. I loved how, how fit it was, but then I didn't realize how gorgeous and luxurious it would be once I added all the, the fur trim. Well, Astrocan fur is very curly and very lamby. I was looking for a very high fluffy pile to fill in the gaps of the center front. So basically I, I opted for like this faux mink. I could find a lot of things in New York, but I couldn't find faux astrakhan fur. And then I basically just sewed on the trim around the perimeter and sewed it to the, um, to the sleeves after adding a little bit of kind of canvas um, reinforcement. 
And just like that, voila, my jacket was so rainy day, two days before Thanksgiving, and I'm walking around the Garment District and other areas in Chelsea looking for my last um, ingredients um, for um, parts, elements for um, this Spencer jacket look. Oh wait, oops, it's just a jacket. I haven't even thought about the pantaloons yet. Never mind. Okay. The pantaloons, generally close-fitting pants that end just above the ankle. Basically what we start getting once knee breaches are getting to become a little bit out of fashion or just saved for formal events by the 1800s, 1810s and whatnot. I wanted them tight, tight, tight. So I definitely wanted some knit wool to fit to my legs. I found this lovely, buttery, Austrian virgin knit wool that felt like the perfect shade of the slightly faded baby blue. I didn't record much of this process because this picture was dated December 8th and I had 12 days to finish my goal to finish on the 20th-ish. I started making a mock-up and took in the necessary parts and I also referred to some historical patterns that I have in pictures and books to be more faithful to that original style. Surprisingly, it ended up fitting better than the commercial pattern. Don't be scared to wear tighter fitting clothing, even if it restricts movement. Is restriction period? Is restriction of movement period? I'll probably make a more elaborate video on, on pants someday, but this ain't the time because I have no footage of that. But I'll be doing knee breeches because knee breeches, knee breeches, knee breech. The most drama that happened with these pants, as you can see, um, is the little cut in that I accidentally did by mistake into the very front of the fashion fabric. Um, as you can see, I did a little emergency situation. I hem um, I sewed it up and then added a little interfacing to the back just to make it extra sturdy. The fun part of these pantaloons are, as you can see, this the braiding being placed and sewn upon the front of the pants, as seen on many military pants of the time. Some are more elaborate than others. Like this pair of Hazard pantaloons I found at a museum in Paris. I painstakingly pinned them down, basted them down, basted parts so I could gather curves, um, set an iron to some of those curves to make it really fit down. Then I back stitched it and whip stitched it on permanently. Thank you to Pinsent Tailing for that video on your impossible trousers where you add the, the hoodie cording to the front of your pantaloons. Okay, the hat. Casquette de drap. Pardon my French. So this hat, it was kind of hard to find much about it because I did not even know what it was called. I eventually found some terms on some rehistorical store sites called calling it a confederatka or a chopska or someone referring it looking like a Polish lancer cap. Again, this is a military inspired piece of clothing. Groundbreaking for this time. I started off with a basic baseball cap. I got a short brim, as you can see in this picture. Got it from Amazon. I sewed a strip of canvas all around the perimeter just to give it some extra structure because I wasn't sure how, how easily the, the fabric was going to hang or stand tall because it's a pretty tall hat. Then I just drew the shapes. You know, I just drew four of the same shape as I saw it. A curve. Just drew this shape. I drafted it based off of some pictures I found on Pinterest and it worked out. I didn't make a mock-up and I made it work. Um, it was a little too too tall at first but then I just cut it down a little bit and I hand sewed it onto the cap. I was feeling like a real milliner. Oh actually well then I got crazy and I decided to add some layers for some stiffness so I added some felt and then I added the same wool that I made the coat from on top and then I decided to quilt it because I was crazy and I thought it would look cute so I was kind of happy with that and then I just sewed some metallic tape to the front and around the box the top part of the cap I did it all inside out and then and then I turned it all back in poked it out the corners and in one of the pictures from the the true skater there's a picture of a guy with the Chopska hat with fur on it so I just thought I had some extra fur so I thought I would add the fur to, to complete the look. I finished it on the 18th or the 20th and I needed to find a friend to take pictures of me. I had a friend from high school in town 
who I hadn't seen in like 10 years. And so I just made him my, my guinea pig and make him take pictures of me at an ice rink out in public. And I forgot the gloves for the photo shoot, which is a bummer uh, because I also, I got these like yellow buckskin and I even sewed them in so they wouldn't be as like chunky and uh, utility utilitarian and I didn't bring them. But I brought them to Christmas, the Christmas walk with my friend. Okay, it is time for what I'm gonna call the toot and total because I am gonna be playing an instrument while I break down what I spent on my supply. First up is the red Italian wool fleece. It's $24 a yard and I got two yards. The fur trim was $19 a yard and I got four yards. The red polyester cording was $3 a yard and I got five yards. The 12 toggle buttons and two buttons that I put in the back was a total of 32. The nail polish, two bottles, and a top coat went for 12 bucks. The Austrian double knit virgin wool was one of the hard hitters. It was $82.95 a yard and I got one and three quarters bringing us to about 145. I got some tape, trim, and thread for about 20 bucks. The short brim hat base that I bought on Amazon was 12 bucks. And the final total comes to about $360. Not cheap, but honestly it was worth it for those pants. This has been a journey. It's gonna be a messy video, but thank you for watching. Goodbye.